Hello, I'm Emma Sill from the University of Manchester and the Christie NHS Foundation Trust in Manchester, England. On behalf of my co-authors, it's my pleasure to present to you results from cohort E of the Majestic 2 trial in which patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma were treated with teclistamab, daratumumab and lenalidomide. Teclistamab is the first off-the-shelf bispecific antibody approved for patients with triple glass exposed relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. As monotherapy, it demonstrated a high overall response rate of 63% and represents a new therapeutic option for these patients. It works by redirecting CD3 positive T cells to mediate T cell activation and subsequent lysis of BCMA expressing myeloma cells. An established standard of care is the combination of daratumumab and lenalidomide. Daratumumab is directly cytotoxic to myeloma cells and may enhance the anti-myeloma activity of teclistamab, as shown in the TRIM2 study, while lenalidomide also kills multiple myeloma cells via apoptosis and enhances T-cell activity. Combining tecdaralen as a fully immune-based triplet may therefore enhance efficacy in patient outcomes. Here we present initial safety and efficacy data for these patients who received tecdaralen in the Phase 1b Majestic 2 study. Patients enrolled in this cohort of Majestic 2 had measurable disease as per IMWG criteria and had received one to three prior lines of therapy. Patients can receive weekly teclistamab at a dose of either 0.72 milligram per kilogram or 1.5 milligram per kilogram. Starting at cycle three, those in the 1.5 milligram per kilogram group transition to three milligrams per kilogram every two weeks. Patients also receive 1800 milligrams of subcup daratumumab as per the approved dosing schedule and 25 milligrams of lenalidomide daily for 21 days of a 28-day cycle starting at cycle two. Steroids were kept to a minimum number of cycles and 40 milligrams of dexamethasone was given weekly during cycles two to four. The primary endpoints are incidence and severity of adverse events and frequency and type of dose-limiting toxicity, while key secondary endpoints include response rates and duration of and time to response. The median age of patients treated was 65 at the 0.70 milligram per kilogram level and 60 at the 1.5 milligram per kilogram dosing level. Over one third of patients had high risk cytogenetics, defined as at least one of the following abnormalities, DEL17P, DEL414 or DEL1416. In keeping with the eligibility criteria, the median number of lines of therapy was two and all patients had received a prior proteasome inhibitor and IMID. About a third of patients had previously received an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody, a third were refractory to lenalidomide, and about 20% were refractory to daratumumab. The most common hematologic adverse event was neutropenia, which occurred in 84% of patients, but there were only four cases of febrile neutropenia. The non-hematological adverse events were mostly of low grade. The most common non-hematological adverse event of interest was CRS, which occurred in 81%. There were no grade 3 or 4 CRS events and no cases of ICANs. There were two fatal adverse events, both of which were infections, which I'll discuss in more detail shortly. Although CRS occurred in 81% of patients, all events were grade 1 or 2, and 97% of events occurred during cycle 1, and all resolved. The median time to onset and duration of CRS events reached two days, and 78% of patients received supportive therapy. The most frequently administered treatment for CRS beyond standard supportive measures was tocilizumab, which was given to 40% of patients. Infections occurred in 91% of patients, but the majority were grade 1 or 2. The most common infections were COVID-19, upper respiratory infections and pneumonia. Of the 12 patients who had COVID-19, four were unvaccinated. Two patients discontinued due to COVID-19, and one of these patients subsequently died of this infection. This was one of the two uh, fatal adverse events I mentioned previously. The other was a case of multi-organ failure due to sepsis. After a medium follow-up of 8.4 months, the overall response rate was 93.5%. At data cutoff, complete response or better was achieved in over 55% of patients, 
in both dosing groups and a very good partial response or better was achieved in 90%. The median time to first response was one month and the median time to CR or better was three months. At data cutoff, 81% of patients remain progression free and on treatment. There were three discontinuations due to progressive disease, two due to COVID-19 and one due to death from sepsis. Response has deepened over time and the median duration of response had not been reached at the point of data cutoff. In conclusion, the early data presented here suggests that the combination of tech darilen has the potential for deep and durable responses in patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. The activity of this triplet was promising, with rapid responses that deepened over time, with 81% of patients being progression-free and on treatment at data cutoff. The safety profile of the triplet was consistent with the individual agents, and no new safety signals were identified. There were no grade 3 or 4 CRS events and no cases of ICAMS. Infections were common, but mostly of low grade, although two infection-related deaths were noted. These results support the prospective comparison of tech darilen versus darilen dex at an earlier line of therapy as planned in the up and coming Majestec 7 trial. The Majestec 2 trial was funded by Janssen Research and Development and Janssen Global Services funded medical writing support for this presentation. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the patients who participated along with their families and carers. I'd also like to thank all the physicians and nurses at study sites who cared for patients and supported the clinical trial, as well as all staff members involved in data collection and analysis. Thank you for your attention.